I would like to ask uh, our president, uh, Dr. Forbantin, to come and introduce our inaugural uh, uh, presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Dr. Krista Dolores, thank you very much. Uh, it is a real pleasure to welcome all of you to uh, uh, the inaugural Thomas uh, Scholl Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. Um, unfortunately, uh, Tom Scholl, a great friend of the institution, uh, a wonderful personal friend for me, a member of the Board of Trustees, and uh, uh, a truly uh, wonderful trooper. Uh, who is doing a whole host of things for this institution, could not be with us because he had another obligation um, today. And uh, uh, as many of you know, he, he lives in the Washington, D.C. area, so he couldn't travel to be with us. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of this opportunity to wholeheartedly, uh, on behalf of the whole institution, thank Tom Scholl for his generosity in establishing an endowed fund that has made uh, this particular lecture series focusing exclusively on entrepreneurship possible for uh, Stevens. Tom has been giving so selflessly of his own time and expertise to the university, but now he's providing his uh, own financial resources um, to continue to uh, make uh, entrepreneurship a priority at, at our institution. With this in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce our inaugural Thomas H. Scholl uh, entrepreneurship uh, lecturer. Uh, and uh, we thought it would be difficult to find anybody better than our speaker today, David Hirschberg, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, David is, uh, uh, exemplifies what you might have in mind as an entrepreneur. And you will learn more about that when you, when you hear a more uh, detailed description of uh, Dave's career and his accomplishments, and in particular his accomplishments as an entrepreneur and a businessman. But also, Dave is an alum of uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. And in addition to that, uh, he is a close friend of Tom Scholl a person uh, he has known for, for decades. So on the one hand, he's a friend of Tom Scholl, the person who's behind this endowed fund. Uh, he is a Stevens alumnus, and he is an immensely successful entrepreneur. Uh, we were hoping that Tom Scholl himself would be here and would make some introductory remarks. I mentioned to you that he cannot be here, but he sent a few words that he's asked me to read on his behalf. First, let me apologize for not being with you in person today due to a conflict I couldn't avoid. It's my pleasure to have created an endowment for visiting entrepreneurs at Stevens. My ob objective is to bring some of the best and most successful entrepreneurs here to speak and engage with students, faculty, and guests. I hope to create the opportunity for you to hear the story behind the story and directly from the people who made it happen. From those people, you will find out there is not one way, but many different ways to start a company and grow a business. Of course, it's really sweet when, when one of those successful entrepreneurs happens to be a Stevens alum and whom I also count as a good friend. I am very pleased to introduce Mr. David Hirschberg as our inaugural speaker for this new lecture series. I am sure many of you know that just a few weeks ago, Dave was recognized by, by Stevens with the Charles V. Schaefer Jr. Entrepreneur Award. And this is absolutely true. Dave is an inveterate entrepreneur who knows one of the secrets of success is finding great people to work with and giving them both the freedom and the structure to achieve what's never been done before. Dave is the perfect inaugural speaker for this series. In working with Dave over many years, I have seen his values remain constant through ups and downs. For example, in business, Dave never puts, puts on airs. What you see is what you get, and honesty and integrity always come first. And as, engineer, as an engineer at heart, one always knew when Dave said the thing worked, it worked. It didn't sort of work. 
it fully and completely worked. Thank you, Dave, for coming here to talk to us today. Finally, to further introduce Dave, we'd like to play a background video, which can also be found on his company's website. So without further ado, we're going to watch the video, and then Dave will come up to deliver his speech. We come together this evening to pay tribute to our friend and colleague, Dave Hirschberg, recipient of the Leroy R. Grumman Award for Outstanding Technology Leadership. Dave has had an extremely productive and eventful life with many outstanding accomplishments. Dave's grandparents and father, a civil engineer, immigrated from Poland to Albany, New York, where Dave was born in 1937. In these early photos taken with his family, Dave is shown to be a typical kid. However, by the time he had turned 11 years old, he was already reaching out to the world through his home-built ham radio, taking his first steps toward a lifelong interest in global communications. Dave received a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, a school also attended by his father Ben and brothers Phil and Danny. He later obtained master's degrees in electrical engineering from Columbia University and management science from Stevens Institute of Technology. In 1959, Dave began his career at ITT Defense Communications. After a brief and boring assignment in circuit board development, he jumped at a ground floor opportunity to work on satellites, a job nobody else even wanted. From that point on, the die was cast. Dave began the next five decades by getting married to Arlene, the love of his life, and went on to start and grow a wonderful family. Dave's career continued to blossom and gain momentum. Along the way, he started three different satellite companies. He spent 18 years at Satellite Transmission Systems as president and CEO, where he built the company into a global SATCOM leader for ground station systems. During his tenure at STS, the company became the first in its field to receive the coveted ISO 9001 certification and was also voted New York State Exporter of the Year in 1992. In 1994, Dave founded Globecom Systems and two years later its subsidiary Globecom Network Services was born. Together they have become both innovators and global leaders in providing communications throughout the world. Today, Globecom is headquartered in a 123,000 square foot hop hog facility. Globecom has a staff of 400 working in the diversified fields of wireless communications, satellite infrastructure development, government and military contracts, maritime communications, and satellite distributed entertainment. Dave is known as a skillful leader and people person throughout Globecom and the industry. Here's what others say about him. A Manhattan-based consultant for the satellite communications industry said, Hirschberg commands respect from his staff by pure presence. He keeps people loose and they respect him because he does what they do. He can look at engineering technology and a lot of algorithms and say, you know what, here's how we solve the problem. Many feel that the extremely low employee turnover rate at Globecom is a direct result of Dave's leadership style. Dave has been my mentor at Globecom for 10 years, and his guidance on such things as diplomacy, ethics, and life values has been priceless, and his philosophies will live with me forever. Spanning more than 50 years, Dave's career is packed full of awards and achievements. In addition to starting three successful satellite companies, he has addressed the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, continually pioneered new technology and services, developed new markets, motivated his colleagues and co-workers, and, together with Arlene, raised a wonderful family of three children and seven grandchildren. Dave is considered an industry leader by many of his peers. He has championed many new technical and management innovations, been the recipient of the prestigious Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, inducted into the Long Island Technology Hall of Fame, holds several patents and technology just to name a few of his accomplishments. We are sure the future will bring many more successes today. David Hirschberg, a life of accomplishments. David.
Well, you know, after that, I, uh, I forgot most of that stuff. It's pretty good. Thank you. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, thank you also very much for inviting me here. It's a, it's a very big honor, and uh, I really appreciate this kind of audience that is interested in becoming entrepreneurs. If they're listening, if they're listening to some of the presentations this morning, I can tell you, these people that you listened to this morning, they did all the hard parts. The hard parts are the technology, the work, the, the hours they put in to develop these kind of products and these services that they're talking about. What I'm going to talk to you about today is not rocket science. This is really basically, you know, entrepreneurship and the ideas that I have learned over 53 years of being in the business, uh, some of it the hard way. And uh, I, as I go on, if any of you want to interrupt me or ask me any questions, I'd, I'd appreciate it. When we get all done, you can ask questions, or as we go, we can ask questions. I think the idea of uh, wanting to be entrepreneurs <coughs> is a, from my point of view, is, is really an excellent idea. I, I was very much afraid of trying to start my own company when I first got out of school in 59. <coughs> I went to work for a large corporation here in New Jersey. That's why I was able to come here at nights and go to school here. And uh, my father, who was a civil engineer, was a city engineer in Albany, and he started his own firm when he was 58 years old. And he was always after me to start my own firm. And I was always telling him, well, look, you know, it's satellite communications. This is the preview of very large companies. It's very difficult for a guy to get off the ground and start a company. He always said, look, uh, you think you've got any kind of uh, security working for a big company. People think that way. I thought that way. In the end, he was absolutely right, because I started working for ITT, and eventually uh, we built the company, our division up pretty well, and they decided to move it down to North Carolina. And that's what happens when you work for a large company. You think you have security, and as you can tell, a lot of what goes on in the labor markets, companies that make it and don't make it, if you're on your own, at least you know you're the one responsible and you're the person, you're the person that's going to make the right or the wrong decision and it's going to depend on you and whether you're going to have a job or not have a job. So I really encourage people to go out on their own, even if, you know, even if you don't succeed the first time or the second time, but at least it's going to be your company, you're going to have control of your own destiny. So I'm going to go through a few of the principles that I've learned along the way. and. Uh, talk to you about them. I left the RPI in 59, I graduated there, and there, at that time there was a new field, completely new field called satellite communications. Now, why am I in satellite communications? Well, as this, this uh, video showed, I, I started as a ham radio operator 11, when I was 11 years old, and my dad had a very good civil engineering firm, and um, he basically said, uh, after I got a D in mechanical drawing, uh, you're not going to be you're not going to be a civil engineer. You, your drawings are way too sloppy. So what you get my brother became president of that that firm, my, and I ended up going into satellite communications. So it was a new field. I worked at ITT until '72. I started a company in '76 called Satellite Transmission Systems, and I raised through uh, investors $100,000 and. We paid back about a million two. And uh, I started Globecom in 94. And there, one of the things that we were very fortunate of, there was internet came around around the same time and gave us opportunity to provide uh, service to developing countries. And it was a relatively small part of our business, but now it's about 65%. And uh, some of the original investors that we gave uh, about, a, we gave 12 times their money back, they came in and provided financing for us, and uh, we went public in 1997. One of the lessons here is, and along the way, there's been many innovations and disruptions in technology. Uh, satellite communications uh, being a new thing in 59 gave me an opportunity to get in on a, a business that no one else knew a lot more than I did about it. So it was a very good stepping stone. I became a manager there real quick. And when the internet came along, we jumped right into that because we were able to provide communications to developing countries and provide internet services. So the message there is disruptions and new technologies provide great opportunities for people. So this is one of the things to take advantage of when it, disruptions are a good thing as far as trying to get ahead and start a company. So I'm going to give you some uh, 
details about our company. I'm going to go through it pretty quick. Uh, we're a public company. Uh, we're profitable. We're in wireless, government, media, enterprises, and maritime business. We have over 500 employees. Uh, we operate, uh, we provide services in 90 different countries. And we're a global company. We have uh, facilities in North America, with three, three facilities, South Africa, two in Europe, uh, one in Dubai, and uh, one in Hong Kong, and uh, one is in Singapore. So we're basically run, a, we have a network, it's a, it's a worldwide network, connecting all of our facilities together. We provide services to people like, um, one of the major contracts we have is for shipping, shipping industry, 3,500 ships. We can provide services to ships any place in the world using our worldwide network. We provide service to the U.S. government. We provide uh, classified um, encrypted services uh, worldwide for the U.S. government. We uh, do things like provide showtime. Uh, every time you see a showtime uh, media, it comes out of our facility. It's originated in our facility. So we do a lot of different things. And the basic for what we do is we have this core competency of telecommunications. And we try to use our core competency wherever we can. There's another lesson there. It's very hard to go into something that, you know, that other people are in and you're going to catch up. You've got to stick whatever you do, even though you're trying to get newer business and go into newer areas, you have to stay with your core competency. That's the one thing that sets you aside from everybody else. Okay, um, just a little bit about our revenue. Uh, last year we grew to about uh, $382 million of revenue uh, from about $170 million in 2009. Uh, actually, and we're profitable. We do both infrastructure and services. One of the few companies in the world that builds systems, then does manage, manages the systems, maintains the systems, and operates systems for people. That's a brief snapshot of our company. Okay, these are some of the core values I want to talk about. One of the main things uh, that I, I think uh, my uh, dad told me was uh, that you've got to conduct your business that if anything you do will be public knowledge. Whatever you do, you just figure it's going to be on the front page of the New York Times. That's a very simple lesson, but you can see by the news when you talk about what's happened with a lot of different companies. It's very tempting to do things that you don't think is the right thing to do. And in 53 years, you know, I've tried to, to use that as a guideline, and I try to teach all my people that. Don't think you're going to be, real be a wise guy and pull something off that people aren't going to find out about. And most of the time, the people are going to tell you about it is going to be you, because if you ever get in trouble, <laughs> the worst part about getting in trouble is not so much the trouble you're in, but trying to cover it up. So first, first most important thing is run your business like everything you know is going to be public knowledge. In integrity, I think, both for your people and uh, for the uh, companies that you work with, both your customers and your vendors, that's very important. Uh, when I started uh, this company um, uh, in 94, the first contract we got was with Hughes Corporation. And it was a three and a half million dollar contract. We had three employees there and uh, very little money in the bank. And uh, had about $300,000 in the bank, and we got a $3.5 million contract. And I was able to get delivery of $2.5 million worth of equipment, and no one ever asked me, how are you going to pay for it? And the people who gave me the contract never asked me, how are we going to get it done? So that's because if you build up a reputation with your customers and, and, and your customers and your vendors, and you get that kind of trust, it's, it's priceless. And, uh, Okay, corny, the golden rule. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty obvious. This is not a religious, uh, uh, this is not religion. This is just good business. Treat everybody the right way and you, you'll be all right. Uh, I think you have to also, if you have a vision of what you're trying to do, and it's not always your vision, it's people that come up with it. You've got to get everybody in the company on board with it and, marking, and marching to the same step. Uh, what, I, what I like to do is talk about the partnerships we have with our vendors and with our customers. You've got to be part of what their, what their goals are. They'll be part of what your goals are. And qu quality is, um, we, we've been very big on quality. This ISO 9001 is an uni uh, international quality specification. And we were the first ones in our industry to get it back in the uh, early 90s. And uh, this is something that you've got to provide products to your customers that are going to always work because 
just to give you some examples, we provide communications for the White House. We provide communications for our troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, probably the most important uh, communication we provide is QVC. And QVC is, a, in case you don't know, is something my wife cherishes. QVC is a, is a buying channel. We provide three channels of QVC. Now, they came to us because we have a, a reliability that no one else has. We've been operational in service since 96, and our systems have never been down through hurricanes and everything else. So they came to us, and they make about $30,000 a minute during most, and $100,000 a minute during the holidays. So you can understand why you've got to have quality and stuff has to work. And some obvious things, you don't really want to piss off a customer. And uh, customers, are, customers are the people who pay your salaries. The thing that you've got to tell everybody you work for, I don't pay your salary, your customers pay your salary. And uh, basically, it's very, very hard to get new customers. Keep, you've got to keep your old ones. I'm very proud of the fact that I've had customers now over 40 years, the same guys we still work with, those that are still working and still alive. I mean, we still do business with them. And uh, what, what another thing is, we're talking about ownership or, or equity. Uh, one of the things we've done in both companies I started, both the major companies I started, was to distribute stock to just about everybody in the company, no matter who they were. Sometimes a lot of stock, sometimes very little bit of stock. And I think that's a mistake a lot, a lot of people make, is that they, get, they don't want to give that equity out to people. I mean, they pay them a good salary, they don't want to give equity, they want to hold it on. But there's nothing like giving equi equity on distributing ownership of a company to get their, their trust and, and get their enthusiasm and their passion going. You've got to know your business better than anyone. And one of the things I've learned over the years is uh, we brought in with so-called experts. And just about every time we had an expert, they screwed something up. So it's basically, you, you know the business better than anybody else. Keep most of those experts the hell out of there. <laughs> I think you've got to think long and hard about coming to public company. Public companies are great. You can, especially when we went public, you could go public with almost anything. Uh, you have a website, you can raise a couple hundred million dollars. Uh, that's not the case anymore. And there's a lot more regulations and everything. Plus the fact that uh, you get under a lot of pressure when you're a public company. Uh, I used to enjoy it a lot more being public, but what happens is when you're a public company, you're obligated almost every quarter to make a number and keep growing. And that sometimes gives you some very bad decisions to make about shipping equipment out the door that isn't ready and things like that. But you're under a lot of pressure every quarter to do the right thing. You have all kinds of SEC regulations, a lot of ways you can get in trouble. So, and that goes back to number one, conduct your business as if anything you do will be public knowledge. And then uh, I think the other thing is to develop a company with a culture that everybody buys into. Well, I, I like to think of our company as, a, as really a family. Uh, I'm proud of, most proud of the fact that we basically have almost no turnover in our company. Most of our managers, we've been together 25, 30 years. And uh, there's, there's no substitute for having people that you can work with all those years. And uh, not, only, uh, not only do they know what they're doing, but they become your friends and your family. A lot of people will tell you, don't become friendly with the people in your company. And uh, when I worked for, when I sold my first company, I worked for a, a boss who said, your problem, Dave, is you're too close with the people you work for. And I said, look, it's the only family I got, so it's the only friends I got, so I got no choice. So I think there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. But people will always tell you, the, the, the problem you get into when you're very friendly with people, there comes a time when you have to change your job or you have to move them to another place. If you treat them fairly and you explain it to them, they might get pissed off for a while, but that doesn't mean you have to fire somebody. But as we grew from a $10 million company to a $400 million company, there are people you have to move around. They just, the, the job is too much for them, and, and, but there are other jobs they can do very well. So we've been able to keep all those people, can always, not always in the same position, but in a position of, of, of trust, in a position where they could really help the company. We talk about bad decisions. Uh, I, I think a thing I, I've learned is a good leader cannot make a company successful by himself. You, the, obviously, our success is due to 400 people that work for 500 people that work for me. It's not me that does that. The key to you, the key is to keep those people passionate about what they do. Treat them fairly. Don't try to keep the politics to a minimum. And uh, 
but a bad leader can destroy things. I tell you, there are so many examples. Uh, one of the best examples is um, uh, what's happened at J.C. Penney. One of the a very innovative marketeer from Apple went to J.C. Penney. He decided he was going to change the culture at J.C. Penney to mirror what Apple did with a completely different market and everything else. You probably know the answer to that. The stock's down 50 percent and they're losing a lot of money. And they just recently got, went back to the old guy that was in there before he came. Okay. Um, one of the things that I think is the most important is um, we, what we try to do with our employees is to make the decision making at the lowest level in the company. The people who are at the lowest level are closest to all of the decisions or all the things. Don't think that you know more than some engineer that's working night and day on a project that you can tell him what to do. And what we do in our company is we, we, we push the decision making down to the lowest level. If somebody's not sure of that decision, where they have a problem with it or they don't really understand it and they want to put the they want to come to me and say look here's what I'd like to do but I'm not sure about it so okay I'll I'll make the decision I'll take the responsibility but 95% of the time the lowest level guy the lowest project engineer the guy is closest to the customer the closest to the problem let him make the decision uh, th this understanding there's between a formal and an informal organization this is one thing as a matter of fact I actually learned at Stevens Guy, uh, our, our professor grew a standard organization chart up that typically companies have, and then he, he drew what they call an informal organization chart. Started drawing arrows between all the different people, how they worked, and it looked like a bunch of spaghetti on a table. You couldn't figure it out, but this is the way companies work. So uh, what we've done in two companies that I, uh, that I, I started, I, uh, I put very large hallways because I'm a guy who doesn't like a lot of meetings because a lot of me, you might find it hard to believe, but meetings waste a lot of time. So what we try to, we try to do is, um, we have big hallways, so we let guys have these meetings in the hallways. We think that's the best way to have meetings. And uh, another thing is uh, new ideas, R&D, different things you want into. Some of the most successful companies around give people, your engineering groups or your, your laboratories, a certain amount of time to work on anything that they want. And believe it or not, those, those things that they work on on their own, they come up with things that have to be done, they think are good products, usually are better than what management decides they, they should be doing. You don't, want to you don't want to follow a crowd. You've got to lead by example. That's all pretty much motherhood. And I think we're back to uh, create a brand that people respect. I think that your brand is, your, is really your calling card. And when they hear the name Globcom, we want them to think about quality about getting the job done on time and um, make, keeping people happy with the, what we've done. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we've finished every job we started in all the years we've worked. Sometimes not on time, sometimes we had to do it two or three times, but we never let a customer down, even though we end up losing money sometimes on projects. But we kept, we kept that, uh, you know, the idea of being a reputable company, somebody that doesn't let the customers down, and that's sort of priceless in being in a business. Okay, uh, employees are our most important asset. That's not rocket science, e rocket science either. Uh, but I was sort of repetitive on this. Um, I think one thing that people really don't understand is that, uh, you know, financial reward is not the only thing that people are looking for in a job. As a matter of fact, I think it's, most studies will tell you it's number four, uh, which is good for me because I have to pay the salaries. But, <laughs> Typically, you know, what you got to, there are so many other things is, you know, the ability to learn, giving people responsibility, a sense of accomplishments when they finish a job, and things like that are the important thing. So we aren't the highest paying company around, but we think we have a, a fun place to work. We have a family atmosphere. We, uh, this year, uh, this says number 12, we are ranked number 10 best company to work for in New York State for large companies. And that's really an accomplishment. Um, as they, I think they surveyed over 4,000 companies. The way it works is they go into the company and they, they give questionnaires out to the uh, employees, not, not the management because you can't trust management. So they give, it out, they give it out to all the employees and they decide and they answer all these questions. And out of 4,100 companies, we came in number 10, which I thought was pretty good because the first nine, when they were telling how they achieved it, 
they were giving like bonuses for everything the guys did. If they came into work on time, if they came, they, they weren't late, uh, they didn't miss any work, they uh, booked a job, didn't book a job, everything was financially rewarded. Uh, we don't have, we have financial rewards at the end of the year if the company does well, but we don't have any of those things along the way. So I was pretty proud of the fact that we came at number 10. I think the atmosphere of trust and honesty, open door policies, when you have to you have to tell people what's going on and be transparent. Uh, we're we're a public company, so some things you can't always broadcast to the whole company. But 99% of the time, we have company meetings. Uh, we tend to tell people all the good things are going on and all the bad things are going on. So people don't have stand around with you know rumors are very easy to start. So you really want to short circuit all of that. You want to have hear right from the guy who's supposed to know what's going on, he'll tell you what's going on. That's why we, we try to disseminate the information on a regular basis to everybody in the company. And, and this open door policy sounds sort of trivial, but we, we really respect that. We allow anybody to talk to any level of management and not to have any repercussions with their boss. And uh, you'll be surprised how many people come into the office and will tell you, you know, all the things, how I'm screwing up, which is, um, which is fine. And uh, sometimes, they're, most of the time, they're right. And uh, so people who are down there working every day, they can come in and tell, and, 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 and if they, they're not getting satisfaction out of their boss, they can come and tell me all the ways that we're screwing up. And uh, I think we have, I think a, a benefit plan is important. You don't want people to be worrying about, you know, their, their health insurance or, you know, 401ks or retirement, any that, you try to do the best you can with your benefit plans. Uh, most important thing I found when I was working for a large company was um, organizational silos. In, in the large company, what happens is the, they're very formal the way they operate. I actually spent some time working in Germany at, uh, for, on a project for NATO and uh, was uh, with Siemens and, uh, and another ITT division I was working for. And, there would be a guy sitting in this office and a guy sitting in that office, and if they wanted to talk to each other, they'd go up through the boss and come back down again. And other ones are things like purchasing departments. Purchasing department is in a silo, right? So they say, you give me all the specs and everything, and then you get out of here, I'll go buy it for you. Or manufacturing, you give me the drawings, and I'll give you, tell you how much it's going to cost, and, and it, we'll build it for you. Well, that all sounds well and good, but it, it can't work that way. You can't be in a position where you have to define everything from one silo to the other and then hand it off. It has to be a teamwork, it has to be collab collaborative between them. When I worked for ITT, one of the divisions I worked for, which was, uh, to me, was almost a disaster, because what we had to do, we had a thing called, we were engineers, we were developing stuff and building stuff. Then they had a thing called manufacturing engineering. So what we had to do was take our product, whatever we were building, and, and we had to define it to an to engineering, manufacturing engineering group who then would take care of, of, of building it. Well, every time we had a quick delivery and, and a tight budget, we ended up building this stuff on our desk and I learned how to use a soldering iron because you couldn't go through that process. And uh, that's sort of just very obvious, but anyway, and the other thing is, you know, who are your key employees? They're not guys like me, they're not guys like our vice presidents. There are so many people within an organization are more key than management. We got so many good people that we've had that work in our laboratories, that are innovative, that are in marketing, that have good relationships, that are so much more important than a guy who sits around behind a desk and manages. So you gotta reward those people at the same level that you reward. Some guy might be a director or be just a senior engineer. He might make more money than a vice president because he's more valuable to the organization. He may not have the managerial skills, but he has the technical skills or the relationships in, in, in sales that are very important. There's um, one person I, I know uh, uh, in this industry who's dynamite. She can sell ice, ice cubes to Eskimos. This, this woman made over two and a half million dollars last year on just commissions. And uh, that's a lot more money than I made. So it's, and we've got, we've got people that some of the very good salespeople, some of the very good engineers that make more money than our vice president. So it isn't only where you are in the hierarchy, it's you gotta understand what's important to, the comp to your company and what's really the person that's making the, you know, making the bucks for the company. And that's how you reward them, not by organization chart. 
Okay, so I'm back to uh, obeying the laws. There's a lot of laws around these days, and uh, they 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 range from all kinds of sexual uh, sexual harassment, age, religious, sexual orientation, discrimination. They're all. I mean, we we had an issue where uh, we are we run video services out of our place and. One of the channels that we had was a fashion channel, and uh, we had these big monitors where they watched, and the, and they had a bikini show or something, and uh, so we we had to go take that down from the monitors because we it was it was deemed that it was um, sexual harassment by having those up on the monitor. So you got to be careful on on these. There's all kinds of laws out there, and they're and they're very strictly strictly enforced. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is probably one of the most important ones, especially if you do business internationally. It's punishable by imprisonment and uh, very large fines. That is, if you pay off anyone to, to, to get a job. Now, I can tell you over the years, uh, it's been very tempting over the years because uh, you, you work very hard, you write a proposal, and you, you're trying to get a, a pro project. and you win the job and the guy says to me, okay, here's my Swiss bank account. You put 100 grand in there and we give you the contract. Well, you, you can't do that kind of thing. You just walk away from it. And you gotta be, I mean, uh, you don't wanna go to jail to get a job. And it, it, it happens more than you would think. And it happens to very large corporations. And it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And you, and you probably don't hear about it much because, but it's very tempting because in, in this world, um, well over 50% of the countries you could do business with have some kind of corruption involved in getting business. And uh, there's an export compliance thing that's very, very strict. If, if, um, if you ship a, a product overseas and it, it's painted olive drab and goes to the military, you gotta, no matter who it's going to, you have to get, uh, you have to get an export license and uh, it's covered under uh, ITAR regula regulations. Uh, we, had a, we had a case um, recently where uh, we delivered, we, we, we built a system for NATO that does force tracking. We track NATO vehicles any place in Afghanistan so they can watch what's going on and they can also call back in if there's any with a uh, panic button or they can run messages from any of their convoys or any of the vehicles back to a, back to a home base. We got an urgent request to modify the system to include the US, the US vehicles. So we, we wrote new software and got it quick, got it out to uh, NATO. Well, we have a compliance officer in our place and said, you know, you can't do that without a license. Even though it was for the US, it was for NATO, it was to save lives, to be able to track American vehicles and NATO vehicles. So we, we, didn't, have, we didn't get a fine, but we got a wrist slap for doing that. That tells you how it's crazy some of these regulations are. If you ship a product overseas and uh, you ship a spare part, it could be a number six screw, and it comes out of that part, you've got to get an export license for it. So there's all kinds of rules that go that way. So the, basically, you've got to have complete comp transparency in your organization. Just, just it's, it's, it's got to be. Just don't, don't even try to get around it. Just complete transparency. You're going to avoid lawsuits and law and, and, and it'll avoid jail time. Okay, uh, financing. Okay, I can't tell you how important it is to have a good, uh, honest, and conservative chief financial officer. I've been, the guy I got now, I've been working with since 82, and this guy has kept me out of trouble every year. We've been public um, at the old company, we're public at this company. We've never had an issue with any of the auditors. So I think that's, because, you know, the, the thing is, he's the guy that has to really look at all the numbers and it's very hard with a company like ours because we have to look at internet we have international organizations international subsidiaries we have to put them all together with a financial statement and that financial statement i have to sign off with every quarter and if there's something wrong about it, i got a chance of going to jail under the sec rules so you need a good guy to you need a good guy to do a to be your cfo and then there's things called socks which uh, has to do with how you run your business and uh, you got all kinds of shareholders trying to shoot at you if the stock price goes down. Uh, private finance, if you're going to do private financing, try to do it with people you know and you trust because uh, there's nothing, if you have a person that puts a lot of money in it and you give them some power and they try to go and micromanage you, they can really wreck you. And uh, a lot of companies, when they're offered money to borrow, 
I, I've seen this happen, and, and it, it happened after 2000 when money was cheap. And money's cheap again, by the way. People borrowed a lot of money, and uh, I, was, um, I was associated with two or three companies. They borrowed so much money that when um, things got tough in, uh, in, in the business, they couldn't meet their interest payments, and they ended up going bankrupt. And they didn't need to borrow that much money. The money was easy to get, so they wanted to expand quickly, and they went and they borrowed it. So I think borrowing, uh, we're pretty conservative in how we borrow. We have very little borrowing that we do. Right now, you can borrow money if you're a reputable company, a little over 2%. So it's very, very tempting to go borrow money. But in the end, if, when interest rates go up and you don't have the money to, to provide, pay the interest, then you've got a problem. Uh, cash is very important. Make sure you have plenty of it. If people offer it to you, take it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so I, I had a little, um, I had this, this picture didn't come out here, but this is something I've seen a lot. Uh, this is 100% of a cherry, and this was 10% of a watermelon. Now, the 10% of a watermelon was this big, and the cherry was that big. So this, the message there is, I, and I've seen this happen a lot of times, um, People are very, they don't want to give up ownership of a company. When I started this company, I had 70% uh, of the company. I, I gave uh, some of our founders another 30%. And uh, what happened is over a period of time, we, we sold stock to get, you know, get funding to, to grow the companies. So I owned 70% of a company probably worth $300,000 at that time. And now I own 10% of a $300 million company. So it's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. So, there more, I, I've seen more people who have a good idea and a good company where people offer you money, and people are going to want something for that money. They'll want a, a good piece of your business, and the kind of business, what they want out of your business is to own a good piece of that business. So what, they, what they'll basically do is uh, they'll ask you for a good piece of equity. Sometimes they ask for, they'll give you a loan. They want options to buy stock. They want warrants to buy stock. They want stock. And you have to really take a look at what's available out there, and you've got to really think about it. You may have to give a lot up, but at least you can get your company off the ground. And if you grow it, and you really grow it, you don't own a lot of the company, but it's worth a lot of money, you're much better off for it. So I, I think people try to take that ownership, and they really bring it into their hearts and say, look, it's my company. I want to own all of it, and, uh, or I want as much, much of it as I can. Well, it, it, I've seen this happen so many times, it just does not work. And eventually, the people lose interest. They don't get the money. They think they can go out and just have some bank loan them money. Banks don't, you know the story, banks don't loan you money if you need it. They only loan you money when you don't need it. So you have a company that's started, getting started. I mean, they're going to loan you money. They won't loan, the venture capital loan you money, but, you know, uh, the venture capitalists, uh, are, are, I don't want to say the pariahs or vultures, but they're really pariahs and vultures. And uh, basically, <laughs> Basically, they're going to take as much as they can get out of you, but they'll, they'll, they're very, it's very important that's where you're going to get your money. So, okay, um, information age. This is sort of new to me because uh, uh, I, I sort of got into computers a little late, but uh, commerce, there, there are so many opportunities for electro, uh, electronic commerce, uh, marketing websites, social networking. Um, we have, we have a very good 24 by 7 uh, system on our, we, we have facilities and equipment all over the world, and we have a 24 by 7 service uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we answer the phones. Most companies, when you call them, you're going to get some kind of, it's very frustrating. You, you, gotta, you get some kind of listen to our menu because the menu has been changed. And then you go into one level of menu, another. So when we started the company, for our customer service, we decided if anybody calls, he's going to get somebody to talk to. So when he, somebody to talk to is going to be an engineer or a technician or somebody who can solve his problem. As a matter of fact, what we do is we monitor our net. We run about 35 networks worldwide. We, own, we have 3,500 ships. We have 20 cellular companies. These are all companies that we manage. We monitor all of those equipments, all of the service, every piece of equipment on those ships, every piece of equipment out in that network. And we see a problem. We actually call our customer or send them an email before they call us. And we can do that 95% of the time. Now, you won't find many companies that do that. And uh, I think that's really a key to success is when you can do those kind of things, people 
like the service. They like the fact that you're willing to help them. If we have a problem, which happens occasionally, we will contact them. Like, for instance, we're going through a big thunderstorm or something, we're having a problem on some of our links. We will send an email or make a phone call to our customers and tell them we are having a problem. We'll be back on in five minutes. Or, and so a good 24 by 7, where you actually have people talking to them, it's, uh, it's really important. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we try to do, um, we, we try to use the internet whatever we can. One of the problems with the internet, as you probably know, is that you have uh, the ability to provide all kinds of virtual communication, Skype, and, and it's very inexpensive, it's, it's cheap, doesn't cost you much, and it's, um, it's, it's very efficient. The problem with communications on the internet is uh, you're going to get hacked. No matter who you are, you're going to get hacked. So one of the things that we're pushing with our customers, both the enterprise customers and government, is to have a completely separate uh, network that doesn't touch the internet. And uh, our customer communications is real. We do a survey every year about about 15 different metrics about the, whether they're happy or they're not happy. And uh, I think it's very important that we, you know, find out what our customers are thinking, not only about what they think about our equipment, but our service. And uh, we have a very, very good, reliable, full-featured IT system, which costs a lot of money. And I sometimes wonder whether it's really worth it. But it really gives us, you know, instantaneous information of what was going on in the system. One of the things you really need to do is you're going to make decent decisions is understand all the metrics of your system of your, of your company and how well you're doing with it. And uh, that helps you make effective and timely decisions. Okay, um, there are some things you can do while you're a student. I, I put a few ones up here. They're probably, they're probably not really that important. I mean, the kind of stuff that I heard today really sort of is, makes this stuff sort of pale. This, you know, I, I think you've got lots of opportunities here to, with the people that you have to be able to go ahead and raise some good money, start a company, and be very successful doing it. And I can tell you there's nothing like it, I think, in the end, when you're running your own company and uh, when you're running your own company and you're responsible for what you're doing, and when you see a parking lot full of, you know, 200, 300 cars and people tell you they bought their house based on what they made on your stock or they uh, sent their kids to college based on it, there's nothing like it. So give it a shot and uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer it. Anybody? <laughs> Well, I, I can tell you, one of the advantages of being an old guy like me is you've been around a long time, you know a lot of people, and I'm very fortunate that, I, I tell you, I've gone out through headhunters and hired a couple of hotshot executives, never worked out, and uh, the ones that have worked out is the ones that I've worked with, I've known all the years, and I've been very fortunate because in my old company, like I, I started that in 76, I left in 94, I have 120 people from that company and my company now. And almost all of the vice presidents are from the, that company. So the, the other thing, though, is we, we've got five acquisitions we made. Now, there, we, there you got to go and really try to understand the companies you're buying, the people you're dealing with. Because if you don't get a guy that you can trust, I mean, here we got two companies in Europe, right? We got one in South Africa, we got two in Maryland, we got one in Singapore. I mean, if you can't trust the people running it, you know, you're nowhere because you can't micromanage those kind of companies. You've got to trust them and you've got to get people with integrity who buy into your own culture. And it, it, it's, it's, so we try to find people that are just, be, first thing, be honest and with some integrity. Then if you can make some money for us, that's even good too. So I think it's, uh, I think that's the kind of things that we look at. Well, I tell you, I've been very fortunate. Uh, we've never re we had one lawsuit uh, since we've been in business, uh, and it was a trivial lawsuit that was di dismissed without the judge dismissed it. Sir, it, it was it, it was wasn't even worth discussing. So we've really never had any real lawsuits, and uh, I think we're the only company, very few companies, public companies especially, who's been in operation almost 20 years and public for 16 years that really never had a lawsuit, and. Uh, I think, believe me, you don't want to have a lawsuit. Back in my previous company, um, I had one lawsuit, 
after we set it up and some of the people came from my other company and the old the people from there um, sued uh, sued our company for s stealing people and trade secrets well one thing I, I did mention was if you're going to hire anybody from a company or uh, uh, your old company not so much other company never never contact them don't ever try to steal anybody from your old company and uh, or from your customers or from your vendors don't Never try to do that. If a guy contacts you, it's fine. So I had 100, uh, I had like, um, in that company, I had maybe 40 people came from the uh, previous company I'd worked for, and uh, they interviewed every one of them. Not one of them said we contacted them. And I think that's very important. Also, you got, when you leave a company, you got to destroy every piece of paper that they own. Don't ever bring a piece of paper with you, because that, that's, that's grounds for a lawsuit also. But so we were sued there. We got that one to go away. And then he sued, they sued one, as part of our suit, they sued one individual who was an R&D guy for that company. And then we got that thing to go away also. And in, uh, so I was at that company 18 years, this one 19 years. We had one real lawsuit in all those years. You don't want lawsuits. They're horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Football, you know, I wonder your main points was that you should try to take uh, politics out of decision-making. How do you keep those components of decision-making You're right. That's, the hardest, that's one of the hardest things you can do in an organization. The, the best way I can explain it is that we've got a lot of people at a level that you would think would, that would, there would be a lot of politics involved. You know, the best thing I can tell you is they've been together for so long. and. Uh, and in most cases, they got a lot of respect for each other, and and they understand that. Po I mean, when I worked for ITT, you would not believe the politics there; they were absolutely horrendous. And uh, none of the people that really should have been, none of the people that should have been rewarded got rewarded. The people that were complete dummies, they got rewarded all the time. So, basically, everybody knows that if you're going to be successful, and the company's going to be successful, you really need to you really need to have people work together. That doesn't say it's not going to happen. But it's, it's probably one of the hardest things you can do. And the, the best way you can do it is you get everything out on the table. Somebody's coming in and telling you how this guy's no good and or thing like that. You get them together and you work it out. Because it's transparency again. You gotta know, everybody's gotta know what's going on. And most companies, it's a hard thing to get around politics. Company politics are, are, are something, but it's, it's disruptive. It doesn't, you don't make any money with it and you don't want it. First of all, you should look at it. It's a beautiful plaque. And it reads, presented to David E. Hirschberg in appreciation of your contribution to the inaugural Thomas H. Shaw Lecture on Entrepreneurship at Stevens Institute of Technology. Okay. Thank you Thank so you very, very much. much. Hey, uh, this, is, this is not only a great school, but they make great plaques. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much.